the gender studies lecture series, of course, is intersecting on many ways with um, the new gender studies minor um, that's being revived at Westmont this year. And so if you're interested in knowing more about the gender studies minor, Dr. Sherry Larson Heckley is a great contact person for you. She has been spearheading the effort to, um, yes, there she is, <laughs> to um, bring this minor back as an integrated part of um, a Westmont degree. And so you can find more information about it on the website through the academic um, homepage, and you can go to the Gender Studies Minor website through that page and get more information on what that minor involves, what faculty are involved with that, and all that you might want to know. This afternoon, we are very lucky to have with us um, Dr. Natasha Duquette and um, her husband, Frederick Duquette. They've come up for today from Biola and from the Talbot School of Theology to be with us, and they'll be speaking on religion, morals, and manners, the spiritual, social, and aesthetic formation of Jane Austen's clergyman heroes. So it should be a very fascinating um, afternoon with them, and I'm glad that you could all be here for it. Um, Dr. Duquette has published um, widely in this field. Um, her writing interest um, address theological and social concerns in women writers, um, particularly from the Victorian period. And so she brings that experience to it. And uh, Mr. Duquette is bringing the theological side as well. He's currently pursuing a master's degree in theology at the Talbot School of Theology. And so it's a nice intersection of two very exciting fields. Um, of course, being religious studies myself, it's really exciting to see people bringing the fields of religious studies and English together in this way. They will speak first, and then we'll have a response from Dr. Larson Heckley. Dr. Larson Heckley, of course, is a professor in our own English department, um, so I'm sure that you all know her already, and I don't need to sing her praises, but I will anyway. <laughs> She's <laughs> also published in the field of um, Victorian women writers, and so she brings that experience to her response, and she's currently working on a project as well on um, the marriage plot in Victorian women writers. And so hearing her response to um, the Duquette lecture will be an exciting part of our afternoon. So without further ado, please. Okay, and it's important to place Austen um, very carefully historically. She's often thought of, along with the Victorian novelist, but she was actually writing in the Regency period, right before the Victorian period. So she had passed away by the time Queen Victoria came to the throne. So she's more uh, con pre-Victorian context for those later writers like Charlotte Bronte. Okay, before we begin, I would like to thank Biola University for a Biola research grant that has enabled this research that Fred and I are doing together. <coughs> okay, so through analysis of Jane Austen's clergymen in training, Henry Tilney, Edward Farrars, and Edmund Bertram, this paper will consider whether aesthetic judgment and spiritual discernment are formed most effectively through university education or through human relationship. Austen is often perceived as an anti-clerical satirist due to her infamously comic but minor uh, uh, character, Mr. Collins, in Pride and Prejudice. Less attention has been paid to the subtle character development of the sensitive and compassionate clergymen who take their call to service seriously, and that would be Henry Tilney, Edward Farrars, and Edmund Bertram, each engaged to an Austen heroine by the end of Northanger Abbey, Sense and Sensibility, and Mansfield Park, respectively. Austin was the daughter and sister of ordained clergymen, and she termed Mansfield Park her, quote, novel about ordination. Through each of her clergymen heroes, Austin shows that an Oxford education in aesthetic as well as theological judgment will not prompt spiritual formation on its own. It is through serious experiential errors in practical judgment that her clergymen heroes experience a degree of emotional pain, discover humility, and mature spiritually. And C.S. Lewis has written about this in her heroines, and we're tracing a similar pattern in the heroes as well. Eventually, Austen's clergymen in training move past the assured hubris of aesthetic, intellectual, and emotional certainties, 
towards a greater openness to the possibility of learning from others' perspectives, including the heroines, which leads to their fuller perception of reality. This process has a positive effect on the clergyman hero's ability to take ethical action in the world and hence fulfill their calling to both individual and social virtue. Recent books with titles such as Jane Austen and Religion, 2002, Miniatures and Morals, The Christian Novels of Jane Austen, 2004, and most recently, Jane Austen's Anglicanism, 2011, evidence a growing interest in reading Austen's novels within their intellectual, cultural, and theological contexts. Austen's was a culture deeply concerned with the intersection between ethics, aesthetics, and practice faith. Theologian Soren Kierkegaard argues in either or that the individual of passive aesthetic judgment must mature into the responsible person of active ethical discernment if, quote, he is going to develop in his life the personal, the civic, and the religious virtues. This is one model of spiritual formation, but Austen's literary role models suggest otherwise. Austen was fond of the Reverend, Reverend Thomas Sherlock's sermons, and Sherlock draws heavily on 18th century aesthetic theory while discussing the power and mystery of Christian salvation. In his 1764 discourses preached at the Temple Church, Sherlock writes, quote, Consider the essential difference between good and evil, the natural beauty of the one and the natural deformity of the other. Compare them to the essential holiness of the deity. There may be wisdom and holiness in salvation, but not human wisdom, nor holiness that human reason can discern, but infinite mysterious wisdom and holiness. Sherlock depicts the grace extended through Christ's atonement not as beautiful, but as sublime. In his philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful, Edmund Burke defines the sublime in terms of power, wisdom, justice, but also difficulty and obscurity, as opposed to the smallness and clarity of the beautiful. And four years later, Sherlock applied Burke's knowledge of sublimity to the salvific power of the cross. For Sherlock, the paradoxical justice of God's grace in response to our sin presents a, quote, difficulty, quote, above the reach and comprehension of human wisdom. This statement parallels the definition of the sublime presented by a female contemporary of Jane Austen's, Marianne Schimmelpenink. In Schimmelpenink's theory on the classification of beauty and deformity published in 1815, she argues, quote, the sublime, as the term implies, consists in that which is above us and which the mind cannot grasp. Schimmelpenink echoes a woman writer who Austen definitely read, the Gothic novelist Anne Radcliffe. Radcliffe's novel, The Romance of the Forest, contains a clergyman who teaches the heroine Adeline the, quote, rudiments of astronomy in order to point her, quote, towards the great first cause whose nature soars beyond the grasp of human comprehension. Evangelical William Cooper, Jane Austen's favorite poet, shared this penchant for evoking divine sublimity. In Ballad Stanza, he writes, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Cooper continued to write verse evocative of the sublime, using imagery to, such imagery to political ends as he became ethically engaged in the anti-slavery movement. Though more interested in the picturesque than the sublime, the Reverend William Gilpin, Whose, whose works Jane Austen also studied and admired, connected aesthetics with right living, alternating the publication of treatises on the picturesque with sermons, admonishing his readers to remember God's mercies as comfort in affliction and, quote, rejoice evermore. In her book, Jane Austen and the Clergy, Irene Collins reminds readers that in Austen's time, the clergy as a whole were noted for their interest in the picturesque, but she does not look closely at how Austen ties spiritual formation to the shifting aesthetic judgments of her clergyman heroes. That connection between aesthetic discernment of the picturesque as well as the sublime and spiritual growth is what we seek to explore. Thank you, Natasha. <coughs> uh, Northanger Abbey presents Henry Tilney, a practicing young pe uh, preach, uh, pastor, achieving insight into life via avenues outside of his formal training through his relationship with Catherine Moreland. This character development impacts his spiritual formation, as one's private experience impacts one's profession and calling. In Northanger Abbey, Henry Tilney figures as a rather charming wit, intriguing to Catherine Moreland, doubtless honed by his formal education. But his philosophical disposition verges on arrogance, and in the case of his brother's unethical intentions towards Isabella Thorpe, regrettable justification. <laughs> 
as events unfold, Henry's character is formed through his interactions with others towards the virtues of modesty and humility. How does Austen consider this impact, and how are we, as readers, to consider it? Um, in Northang Northanger Abbey, interactions between Catherine Morland and Henry Tilney <coughs> act as a catalyst for character formation. The Apostle Paul nominates love as the greatest of spiritual gifts. Henry and Catherine possess youthful, infatuated passion, but we truly see the fruit of love at work in them when such passion is girt with accountability, integrity, and discernment. In Northanger Abbey, Henry Tilly T Tilney tells his amour, Catherine Morland, to remember that we are English, that we are Christians. But the statement is in contrast to Henry's regrettable defense of his brother, a cad whose disingenuous attentions towards a willing Isabella Thorpe lead to the humiliation of Catherine brother, Catherine's brother James, to whom Isabella is engaged. Henry appears oblivious to his brother's character flaws, to the point of vindication when he states of Frederick and Isabella, their hearts are open to each other as neither heart can be to you. They know exactly what is required and what can be borne. And you may be certain that one will never tease the other beyond what is known to be pleasant. In his essay, Real Men Read Jane Austen, Peter Lighthart argues, a quote, a central tenet of Austen's writing is the belief that how someone speaks manifests the quality of his mind and character as much or even more than what he says, close quote. The medium is the message. However, with Henry Tilly, we see an eloquent man, well-spoken and sensible, an Oxford-trained clergyman attuned to the picturesque charms of creation, revealing a striking moral blindness. A change of style reveals a moral flaw. Note Henry's soothingly lyrical tone in his assurance that Isabella and Frederick will never tease the other beyond what is known to be pleasant. Yet quickly falters into low imagery and farce as he dismisses the moral risk of their flirting. Quote, and what will then be of their acquaintance? The mess room will drink to Isabella Thorpe for a fortnight, and she will laugh with your poor brother over Tilney's passion for a month. Lightheart's observation that Austen, character, and style require refinement on the issue of character formation. Henry's diction is used by Austen to foreshadow, with dramatic irony, a conflict in moral character. The reader is hardly convinced of Henry's assurances. It's not as if his tasteless predictions regarding Frederick and Isabella portend a harmless consequence. Consider, consider Austen's contrasting style. Henry's optimistic forecast that all will end well in alehouse cheers and in the laughter of the betrothed at the expense of the unrequited is hardly what is known to be pleasant, never mind what is English or Christian. The idea that an aesthetically pleasing, witty style reveals sound character appears to falter on the question of Henry's lack of discernment regarding his brother. Lightheart's observation about style and character quality is essentially correct but Austin is after bigger game, social commentary and moral character development. Style mirroring character is a means to an end. This is further evidenced in the serious matter of uh, family dynamics. In clinical observation on spiritual formation, it has been demonstrated that unhealthy family familial attachment to parents can frustrate growth and maturity. The barriers to holistic spiritual formation are often predicated in family relationships. Scholars in the field of spiritual formation have observed that one's image of one's parents influences spiritual health. Austin examines the Tilney dynamic and takes the reader into the Tilney home, the architecturally sublime Northanger Abbey, through C uh, Catherine's visit, during which she witnesses a tyranny of a father unconsciously deforming sibling, relation sibling relationships, warping their British and Christ Christian natures. Faith and morals based on intellectual assent presume a spiritual state. Optimism. This is evidenced in Catherine Morland's assessment of General Tilney en route to Northanger Abbey. Quote, General Tilney, though so charming a man, seemed always a check upon his children's spirits, and scarcely anything was said but by himself. 
the observation of which, with his discontent at whatever the inn afforded and his angry impatience at the waiters, made Catherine grow every moment more in awe of him. Close quote. Catherine's reading of Tilney as himself sublimely awe-inspiring is inherently trusting and assumes the good that his behavior implies something greater than that of an objectionable or ill-tempered boor imprisoned by the malcontentness that only superfluous wealth can bring. Hence, the paradox of Catherine's ascent to a greater good. She attributes the universal to all particulars and in doing so loses discernment in idealism. General Tilney himself suffers equally, for his assessment of Catherine is based entirely on an alleged of fortune bequeathed to her by an amorous John Thorpe's inflationary imagination, as obvious as it is pathetic. As the Apostle Paul observes in 1 Corinthians 8.1, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. But in Northanger Abbey, ardent love puffs up false knowledge, whether due to Gothic sensibilities, infatuation, or fortune hunting. General Tilney's matchmaking blends the Philistinian pragmatism of a fortune hunter with the pharisaical disposition of the pitiless, throwing Catherine out of Northanger Abbey when, she dis when he discovers she is not a wealthy heiress. This is a crass reduction of human life to social expen expendability by a conniving social climber a worthy of a Gothic villain, which partially vindicates Catherine's speculation that the widower General Tilney had actually murdered his wife. Honoring the father figure is central to Christian sanctification, as our parental images can affect our relationship to God, yet it can be negatively influenced by childhood attachment and family dynamics. The Tilney, fam the Tilney children react to their father's often callous tyranny. Frederick in his cavalier treatment of women. Henry in his dismissive justification of family behavior and Eleanor in her painful forbearance of duty and respect for her father, revealed as she dispatches the eviction of Catherine, quote, dear, dear Catherine, in being the bearer of such a message, I seem guilty myself of all its insult, yet I trust you will acquit me, for you must have been long enough in this house to see that I am but a nominal mistress of it, that my real power is nothing, close quote. Eleanor is tragic in her countenance as mistress of the house, a sad duty brought by her mother's death, frustrated in sharing a burden her mother knew too well, a powerlessness that verges on despair. <coughs> However, the Apostle Paul may yet be vindicated, for true love transforms the bearer. Henry understands the idealism that motivates Catherine's error in judgment regarding his mother's alleged assassin as his infatuation with her recognizes her intuition about his father's objectionable behavior. There is a connection between the two that strips away mere words, but his education is instructive to her when her gothic speculation of foul play is clearly rendered into a formal accusation of murder, the charge is revealed as outlandish as it is baseless. Her realization via Henry that she was accusing General Tilney of murder prompts a passionate despair that she will never be forgiven by Henry. Yet we find, quote, the formidable Henry soon followed her into the room, and the only difference in his behavior to her was that he paid her rather more attention than usual. Catherine had never wanted comfort more, and he looked as if he was aware of it. He had already forgiven her and is still drawn to her still. Catherine learned something of herself through Henry, quote, it had all been a voluntary, self-created delusion, each trifling circumstance receiving importance from an imagination resolved on alarm, and everything forced to bend to one purpose by a mind which, before she entered the abbey, had been craving to be frightened. Yet, Henry too is equally transfigured by this marriage of passion, reason, and virtue. Henry is not quite so formidable that he does not have something to learn from Catherine, to whom he offers his hands, prompted by the indignation against her unjust treatment by her father, a member of what Henry now understands to be a, quote, forward bragging, scheming race, close quote. Henry is so convicted by his love for Catherine that he now stands up to his father, risking his own exile. His father, quote, could not intimidate Henry, who was sustained in his purpose by a conviction of its justice. 
he felt himself bound as much in honor as in affection to Miss Morland, and believing that, he, that heart to be his own, which he had been directed to gain, no unworthy retraction of, ta of a tacit consent, no reversing decree of unjusti unjustifiable anger could shake his fidelity or influence the resolutions it prompted. The general was furious in his anger, and they parted in dreadful disagreement." Close quote. Um, Note he is sustained in his purpose by a conviction of justice, a formidable ally in the assertion of his own will and the quality of his character. To merely plead to, for Catherine on the basis of his affection alone would have invited scoffs and derision. His ethical voice, engaged with passion, utterly <coughs> demolishes his father's pretensions. The formation of his character was frustrated by his father, a matter he suppressed until a woman engaged him to be a man, breaking him out of the family compact and into his own, a formation of the spirit that cannot be taught, only learned, that to be English and Christian are more than what is generally understood to be. With sense and sensibility, Jane Austen presents a very different type of clergyman in Edward Ferrars. Unlike Henry Tilney, who already has a parsonage and a flock at the beginning of Northanger Abbey, Edward is ordained but without a living for most of Sense and Sensibility's narrative. He is a man with formal theological training who is nonetheless drifting without purpose. His problem is a lack of clear direction, which has harmful effects on Eleanor Dashwood. Before the beginning of the plot, Edward stumbles into a secret engagement with a woman, Lucy Steele, for whom he cannot provide and with whom he quickly falls out of love. He then finds himself caught in an ethical quandary when he meets and falls in love with Eleanor Dashwood, from whom he hides his engagement to Lucy. As opposed to Henry Tilney, Edward is notably plain in person and speech which in the structure of Sense and Sensibility sets him up against the stylish but untrustworthy John Willoughby. The narrator remarks, Edward Ferrars was not recommended to their good opinion by any peculiar graces of person or address. His understanding was good and his education had given it solid improvement, but he was neither fitted by abilities or disposition to answer the wishes of his mother and sister who longed to see him distinguished as, they hardly knew what, they wanted him to make a fine figure in the world, but Edward had no turn for great men or barouches. All his wishes centered in domestic comfort and the quiet of a private life. <coughs> Edward's disposition is well suited to life as a rural clergyman, but how is he to find such a living and what woman will share his domestic comfort? These are the questions that vex him and the reader for the bulk of the novel. Edward is more a man of subdued sense than spectacular sensibility, which causes Marianne Dashwood to condemn him as lacking an aesthetic judgment, revealing an 18th century proclivity for connecting spirituality, ethics, and aesthetics. Marianne judges Edmund by exclaiming, his eyes want all that spirit, that fire, which at once announced virtue and intelligence. He has no real taste. She claims that Edward admires Eleanor's paintings, but does not truly understand their worth. It is important to remember that Marianne embodies excessive hyperbolic sensibility and that she shows a lack of taste and discernment herself when she's taken in by the dramatic Willoughby. Austin engages with philosophical debate on the nature of true versus artificial taste by setting up Edward's, quote, natural taste, which is marked by propriety, simplicity, justness, correctness, delicacy, and purity against Willoughby's false displays of taste, which take in Marianne. Austin draws on David Hume's countering of the false, quote, delicacy of taste which everyone pretends to with true delicacy of taste, which Hume defines as uh, the person with organs so fine as to allow nothing to escape them, and at the same time so exact as to perceive every ingredient in the composition. Eleanor essentially claims this Humean true delicacy of taste for Edward and ties it to justness and moral propriety. However, her own remarks on true taste are clouded by romantic love. And even as Edward shows what Eleanor perceives as correct aesthetic judgment, he is flirting with her while being engaged to another woman, Lucy Steele. Eleanor's pronouncements on Edward's good taste may also be influenced by artistic pride, as Edward shows this propriety of taste while admiring the work of her own hand, her paintings. Austin further complicates her response to David Hume by deploying Humean vocabulary with critical irony later in the novel when Edwards Cox's comical brother, Robert Ferrars, 
holds back customers in a London shop due to his need to exercise fine-tuned aesthetic judgment. Eleanor and Marianne, who've come to the shop to sell their mother's jewels, wait behind him, and the narrator observes, Eleanor was not without hopes of exciting his politeness to a quicker dispatch, but the correctness of his eye and the delicacy of his taste proved to be beyond his politeness. He was giving orders for a toothpick case for himself. After a full 15 minutes have passed, Robert Fars makes his judgment, quote, the ivory, the gold, and the pearls all receive their appointment, and the gentleman, ha gentleman having named the last day on which his existence could be continued without the possession of the toothpick case, drew on his gloves with leisurely care. In her satiric caricature of an urbane and self-obsessed man of fashion, an amoral connoisseur of natural resources imploited from exploited, imported from exploited colonies, ivory, gold, and pearls, Austin points out the social limits of aesthetics, indicating that no matter how delicate, taste should not come before ethics. Austin's critique, suggested explicitly in the case of Robert Ferrars, and more implicitly in his brother Edward, appears Kierkegaardian here. Viewing aesthetic judgment as a childish thing, intention with adult, ethical commitments. But Austin does allow Edward to embrace another type of aesthetic, the sublime, near the very end of the narrative. The somewhat passive Edward receives two unexpected gifts of sublime grace towards the end of Sense and Sensibility. First, when the kindly Colonel Brandon discovers that Edward is engaged to Lucy, with no means to support her, he wisely gives Edward a clergyman's living complete with a yearly income, a parsonage, and a church. Austin strikes an aesthetically satisfying Aristotelian balance between the cautionary reserve of sense and the potentially wasteful excess of sensibility by providing an example of prudent generosity in Colonel Brandon. Next, Edward is suddenly released from his engagement to Lucy when she elopes with his brother, Robert Ferrars. This sudden freeing of Edward is experienced as a sublime event in the narrative, invoking, quote, utmost amazement, wonder, and unspeakable astonishment in all observers. The usually rational and calm Eleanor perceives it as, quote, extraordinary and unaccountable, reflecting the ineffable nature of the sublime, it is, quote, beyond her comprehension, and, quote, baffles her judgment. Even Edward admits that he was, quote, half stupefied between the wonder, the horror, and the joy of such a deliverance. <laughs> After experiencing the paradoxical nature of sublime grace, Edward is transformed into a repentant and grateful man. In her more mature work, Mansfield Park, Austin continues to depict the aesthetic, ethical, and spiritual development of a clergyman hero attuned to the sublime, Edmund Bertram. In Mansfield Park, she again reveals the potential for errors in judgment to be made by a man with a thorough theological Oxford education. Before he leaves home, Edmund Bertram shows innate pastoral gifts of compassion and teaching, comforting the sorrowful Fanny Price by taking her for walks outdoors, providing her with paper and writing materials, and recommending books for her to read, as well as giving her advice, consolation, and encouragement. When he returns from Oxford, however, Edmund falls from the pedestal upon which Fan Fanny had placed him, largely due to his delight in her rival, the ambitious and anti-clerical satirist, Mary Crawford. Austin deploys the language of aesthetics to compare and contrast Edmund's attraction to the sprightly Mary with his relationship to the contemplative Fanny. Austin describes Mary Crawford as picturesque, fit to be made into a picture through Edmund Bertram's gaze. The narrator notes, quote, a young woman, pretty, lively, with a harp as elegant as herself, and both placed near a window, cut down to the ground, and opening on a little lawn, surrounded by shrubs in the rich foliage of summer, was enough to catch any man's heart. Mary has also caught Edmund's eye as a compelling picturesque object, a living portrait famed by a window. Austin's narrative structure invites readers to compare this aesthetic framing to another window, a window through which Edmund and, Gant and Fanny gaze side by side out at the immensity of God's creation. During an evening gathering where Mary engages in more spirited anti-clerical satire, Fanny vehemently defends the edifying effects of sermons. Edmund replies, the man who could quarrel with Fanny must be beyond the reach of any sermons, which causes Fanny to turn into the window, look out at the starry sky, and give a sermon of her own. She eulogizes, quote, when I look out on a night such as this, I feel as if there could be neither wickedness nor sorrow in the world, and there would certainly be less of both if the sublimity of nature were more attended to, and people were more carried out of themselves by such a scene. 
Here, Fanny echoes the ideas of Sherlock, the clergyman whose sermons Austin most admired. Sherlock argues that men and women, quote, need but open their eyes and look round them to see the wonderful and stupendous works of nature, which lead directly to the knowledge of God. After Fanny's heartfelt sermon on general revelation, Edmund points out the constellation Arcturus to her, and they share a moment of contemplative communion. But he is quickly abrupt and abruptly torn from this moment to dance a, quote, glee with Mary Crawford. Mary does not share Edmund and Fanny's taste for the sublimity of nature. Later, when Fanny shares her sincere wonder at the, quote, growth and beauty of the landscape and the, quote, wonderful, incomprehensible workings of human perception, Mary remains, quote, untouched and inattentive. Edmund's attraction to Mary leads to his own loss of moral and aesthetic judgment, which is evidence in his neglect of Fanny and in his willing participation in the play Lover's Vows. Fanny objects to the staging of this play in her uncle's home while its owner is away, stating, quote, everything of higher consequence was against it. Samuel Johnson, Austin's preferred writer of moral prose, defined the sublime as that which is of, quote, higher consequence. And when Edmund gives in and joins the rehearsals for the play, Austin's narrator suggests that Fanny has surpassed her teacher, noting, quote, Edmund had descended from that moral elevation which he had maintained before. Fanny continues to correct Edmund after her uncle Sir Thomas Bertram has returned from the West Indies. Edmund tells Fanny that she should speak up more in the presence of her uncle, and she replies, did you not hear me ask him about the slave trade last night? Gabrielle White reads this as a subtle anti-slavery statement on Austin's part, which gives political weight to Jan Narden's observation, quote, true propriety can only spring from sincere moral commitment to self and others in society. Fanny continues as the novel's index of propriety, even as Edmund falters, and ironically, the foppish Henry, Henry Crawford has what the narrator calls enough moral taste to appreciate Fanny's loving character when Edmund does not. Eventually, Edmund Bertram reaches a turning point. He observes Mary Crawford's, Crawford's faults of principle and decides to marry a woman with greater moral strength with whom he has shared aesthetic delight in natural settings since his pre-Oxford days, uh, Fanny Price. Austin's depiction of Fanny as a wise individual concerned with lessening what she calls the wickedness in the world through the exercise of her own natural tastes in attending to the sublimity of nature suggests that spiritual formation often occurs through observations of one's everyday surroundings. Austin advocates the recognition of the sublime in humble everyday environments, which is in, again in line with the sermons of Sherlock. Sherlock distinguishes the sublime of the New Testament from that found in Greek mythology or in the Old Testament. He writes, this is an extended block quote from Sherlock, the Greeks sought after wisdom and thought that if God were indeed to redeem the world, he would act more suitably to his power and wisdom. Whenever they made Jupiter speak, his voice was thunder and the lightning was his appearance and he delivered oracles not to be communicated to vulgar ears. So in the Old Testament, when God speaks, clouds and darkness are round about him, and his presence and his voice are terrible. But here, in the Gospel, everything had a different turn. The appearance was in the likeness of a man and the form of a servant. And as he came in like a servant, he went out like a slave. He was esteemed stricken, and his departure was taken for misery. His doctrine was framed rather to purify the heart and to give wisdom to the simple, than to exercise the head and furnish matter for the curious and learned, to be a general instruction and common rule of life to all men, and not to satisfy the vanity of worldly wisdom in increase above its reach. With him, the precepts of virtue are the principles of wisdom and holiness. Sherlock, like Austin, found reason for su sublime incarnational wonder in the common and the everyday, and claimed this as a more Christian model of sublimity. Austin prompts questions through Mansfield Park. Is Edmund Bertram too caught up in the, quote, worldly wisdom of Oxford to appreciate the humble, everyday, servant-hearted Fanny? Does he need to relearn how to perceive wisdom and sublimity in his natural environment and in his common cousin? <coughs> Jane Austen does admit the possibility of character development arising from formal study. Her own novels function as moral cautionary tales for university students today. And Edrim, Edmund Bertram reveals the impact of his student days when he states, quote, I have not left Oxford long enough to forget what chapel prayers are, close quote. However, 
As 19th century women barred from an, uh, an official Oxbridge, uh, Oxbridge education, Austin places strongest emphasis on character growth within the dynamics of familial relationships on experiential knowledge that arises out of gracious release from the consequences of past errors and on an ethical extension outwards towards God and neighbor that results from attending to the sublime in one's everyday surroundings. And that's the end. watching my alarm. Um, I, I just have a few comments that I want to make by way of a response. And for those of you who are thinking about academic responses, very often they're corrective or critiquing. What I really want to do today is take some of the um, lively and provocative comments we've gotten from the Duquettes and build a bridge from them to the conversations more of us are going to be having about sense and sensibility, either tomorrow after the Real Talk presentation or Saturday around um, the marathon reading in Reynolds Hall, or perhaps <laughs> around conversations that I imagine you all having over your meals and wherever you are between here and there and then. So um, I offer these responses as a bridge, and um, I'm going to forge that bridge to the character of Colonel Brandon. For those of you who know Sense and Sensibility primarily as from the Ang Lee and Emma Thompson film, that might mean that I'm going to be using Alan Rickman as much as Austin's <laughs> fictional hero. Okay. So whether it's Rickman or Brandon, um, I, I'm not thinking totally about a clergyman, but I think there's enough sufficiently <coughs> attractive and heroic in this figure for us to build some kind of bridges there. Um, quite different from Sense and Sensibility's clergyman hero, the twice engaged Edward Ferris, Colonel Brandon, a chapter after we meet him, is described, quote, in his forlorn condition as an old bachelor. Um, Marianne Dashwood's view of Brandon is beyond, as beyond marriage, surfaces repeatedly throughout the early <coughs> portions of the novel. Um, and most strongly, perhaps, when she responds to Mrs. Jennings' jokes on matchmaking with the objection that Colonel Brandon, at least, ought to be protected against any such jests by, quote, age and infirmity. After her female relatives prompt Marianne, who Natasha has reminded us has a certain lack of taste and discernment in some ways with regard to um, understanding character, um, when they reprompt her, she insists that at 35, he has nothing to do with matrimony. Uh, indeed, Mrs. Je I'm really glad you all laughed. Um, <laughs> indeed, Mrs. Jennings is the only character with a sufficiently aggressive um, marital drive to believe that Colonel Brandon can make a match for any suitable young girl. While Brandon's eventual journey does take him down the aisle of the marriage plot um, to its inevitable telltale conclusion, um, the details of the novel also remind us that there's considerable energy invested in the narrative in exploring who he is before he gets to marriage um, and exploring what that permanent state of bachelorhood might look like, even if it involves less infirmity than Marianne wants to attribute to it. Um, in this novel that's committed to propriety rather than spirituality, or rather than piety, we might say, Brandon's motives are not overly spiritualized, and I want to be careful not to be pushing too far to Christianize this novel. But if we read with scriptural lenses, though, we begin to see that his humble acts of justice and mercy um, are as precisely the prerogative of a single man in possession of a good fortune as is the want of a wife. That's if his search is not too desperate. Justice and mercy, of course, are the most evident, um, are most evident in the most forgotten episode of Sense and Sensibility, and I want to talk primarily about that episode, the cautionary tale at the middle of the novel. Um, it's the one that Brandon recounts to Eleanor in what is very near the center of the novel, and one that Lee and Thompson present with pretty a pretty careful degree of literalness with a couple of minor changes that I'm not going to talk about here. But um, the tale is carefully recounted, and Brandon tells the story of his father's former ward, um, a young girl, an orphan with whom he was in love, and the daughter born to her after her divorce, um, who that daughter then, of course, you remember, is seduced and abandoned by Willoughby. 
Okay. If you don't remember the story that well, I think it's a product of Austin's careful narrative containment. At this point in the novel, we're so caught up in Willoughby's jilting of Marianne and actually wondering in some ways, along with Mrs. Jennings, if Colonel Brandon isn't about to propose to her when he takes her into the parlor, that you can forget in that kind of excitement of the marriage plot about this conversation that does go on. Um, it's contained in a chapter of its own, and unlike other parts of Austin's novel, there is almost no narrative interjection. It's purely dialogue. So the narrator stays away from this story of what we would call in 19th century novel discourse a story of a fallen woman or two fallen women. Okay? And yet we seem to need to know this story before we can get to the end of the novel, um, the story of women and sex outside of marriage. This is the story of the two Elizas, mother and daughter. When Brandon cares for the older orphan Eliza, as he does growing up, and then also takes care of her child of the same name, he follows biblical instructions for a church to be pleasing to God. We hear those instructions when the New Testament author James writes that, quote, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world is religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless. In these verses, the epistle writer briefly states a refrain that runs through scripture, care for widows and orphans. Rather than gaining esteem from church attenders around him, though, Brandon's acts of justice and mercy subject him to gossip, as we hear not only in Mrs. Jennings, but also from Marianne and Brandon when he runs away from the picnic that he's planned to try to seek the safety of his ward shortly after Willoughby has abandoned her. Um, while Willoughby has been engaged in sexual impropriety in the terms of the novel, Brandon acts to mitigate that bodily, the bodily damage done to the less powerful orphan Eliza. Brandon endeavors to practice Christian charity, and those endeavors play a part in the discounting for other characters of Brandon's masculinity. Um, we see some of this in the excessive attention to his age and to use Marianne's term infirmity. Um, those also, ironically, account to imputing secrets and scandal to him that no one can name. Rather than having been polluted by the world, to repeat James's words, we might, um, as the continually desirable Willoughby is, and he, made, he stays continually desirable through to the conclusion of the novel, we might say that Brandon is subjected to the world's pollution. Um, Colonel Brandon's previous patterns of doing justice and mercy that we got reminded of, for instance, he is sort of the agent of grace that lets Edward find um, his first living in the church. Um, some questions about his character shift when he marries Marianne Dashwood, which is to say when he reaches what we might think of as the inevitable end of an Austin narrative, marriage. Um, Marianne is now described in the end of Pride and Prejudice as patroness of the village at Delaford. That's how the narrator describes her. She now takes on the good works of the community. Brandon and Marianne are now shown contentedly together, apparently without domestic beauties to distract them in their devotion to each other. Good fortune, or a happy set of circumstances, as Austin describes it, separates Marianne's fate from Eliza's fate, as much as merit or virtue or character. Both young women have tangled dangerously with Willoughby. Grace might be another term to describe Marianne's unmerited felicity, yet I'd say, want to argue again here that it's both unwise and unfaithful to defend Marianne by assuming that she earned the grace that Eliza never enjoys, or to assume that a fictional character earns grace that raises other kinds of problems for us. Um, it would take a willfully erroneous reader of Austen, I think that's to say, to insist that the double sister marriage that concludes Sense and Sensibility does not have a certain triumphant joy. <coughs> it does when we get there. Something is right with the world. Eleanor and Marianne have navigated the aisles of the marriage market and come through with husbands who together create a community where those involved can flourish. The happy ending of the novel with two sisters who manage never to quarrel or to bring quarrels among their husbands is fine. The exclusion from the parish of Delaford of the orphan ward who falls for Willoughby suggests suge seduction suggests only one of the limits of marriage as the sole unit of thriving Christian community. The memory, and it's albeit I think a weak one for most of us by the time we get to the end of the novel, of the two Eliza's stories prompts us to ask where avoiding the pollution of the world, if that's what a sexualized woman's body is, must necessarily also entail avoiding the least of these in orphans and widows. Why can't the young ward be welcomed back to Delaford and the rest of the Christian community that's thriving there? And she's not. She's one of the few characters who is not named as we go through the catalog of characters in the end of the novel. Companion marriage that invites doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with one's God might also include the less fortunate, as the novel's final catalog of characters makes a careful reader patently aware that this character is excluded 
For the young woman with all the power of the patroness of the village to want nothing more from her husband than peace for herself and her extended family might be a sign that sense has finally appropriated temp uh, appropriately tempered Marianne's sensibility. It's also clearly a sign that together, sense and sensibility have not strengthened her charity, but the combination seems to have tempered her husband's charity. Marianne here is by no means lamentable, but there is a clear cost to the work of the gospel that Brand Brandon was doing as a single man. Through Colonel Brandon, Austin reminds us that effectively formative relationships in marriage plot novels, spiritual development, we might say, and in Christian community are not limited to formation of relationships through romantic couples or even through our biological families. 